the same way again. That is great. <laughs> well, I am so excited to be able to bring God's word to you all today. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Seth Udinsky. I'm the director of Youth and Young Adults here at Grace Covenant, and it is my joy to be here with you today to share God's word with you. Uh, I hope that you get something out of this message today. Uh, we are continuing our journey through uh, Paul's letter to the Colossians. Uh, we have finished chapter 2, and this week we're going to start in Colossians chapter 3. Our text for today is Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. So if you're able, would you please stand with us for the reading of God's word? Let's read this together. Paul says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is seated. At the right hand of God, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated, and children, you may be dismissed to your Sunday school class. So as Pastor Tim told us last week, we have reached a turning point in the letter to the Colossians. In chapter 2, Paul uses that word, therefore, which if you see that in the New Testament, oftentimes that means we're turning now from theology to practical application. And Paul continues this in verse 3 with that if then, if then you have been raised with Christ. That's like another hinge point there that Paul's continued from chapter 2. So a question for you to consider as we begin. Do you hate anything? Is there something that you can think of right now that you think, boy, I just despise that thing. I loathe that thing. If so, think about it. What is it? For me, as a lifelong Eagles fan, and my parents are in the room here today, so they can attest to this. As a lifelong Eagles fan, I have and still do hate with a passion the Dallas Cowboys. I hate them. I loathe them. I despise them. Uh, The first three years of my life, I was born in the early 90s, and that was when the Cowboys were really at the height of their glory. Thankfully, for the last 25 years, they haven't been very good, and the Eagles have. But in that early part of my life, the Cowboys won three championships. They were always better than the Eagles. They always beat the Eagles, and they always seemed to enjoy it as well. So I developed a healthy, I think healthy, hatred for the Dallas Cowboys. (laughs) Uh, On a serious note, though, perhaps your hatred is something deeper. Perhaps you've experienced hatred towards another person. Perhaps they've said something to you with their words or actions, or maybe uh, they have treated you badly in the way that they have removed love from you. Maybe someone slandered you, or maybe someone showed hatred toward you. There is hope and comfort for you in the gospel. I want you to understand that, that Christ gives this freely to those who ask for it. He offers healing for brokenness. That's actually a message for another time. I wish we could talk about that, but that's not what we're going to talk about today. My point in bringing that up today is that according to God's word, we are not permitted to hate much, are we? What are we told in God's word? Love your neighbor. Love your enemy. By the way, that covers literally everyone. Pray for those who persecute you. Honor your father and mother. Love your family. Included in that is love your in-laws as well. (laughs) Love the least of these. Love your children. Children, obey your parents. That's the way you show love to your parents. Respect those in authority, no matter who they are, no matter how much you don't like them. 
But there is one thing that the Bible not only permits us to hate, but requires and commands that we hate, and that is our sin. We must hate our sin. So if I can give you one charge to remember for today, it's twofold. It would be this. Delight in Christ and hate your sin. Delight in Christ and hate your sin. This is what Paul takes us to in chapter 3. So let's explore this together piece by piece. By piece. In verse 1 through 4, he says this, If then you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. The imagery that Paul brings us to here is what Pastor Tim explained a couple weeks ago, that we are dual citizens. We're citizens of this world, but more than that, we are citizens of heaven. We belong somewhere else. Even in our dual citizenship, by the way, we're just passing through. We belong ultimately to the kingdom of God if we know Christ. This identity is greater than the identity of being Americans or having a Polish or Irish or Russian background or being black or white or Republican or Democrat. Above all those things, and it's not that those things aren't important, above all of that is our identity in Christ. We are citizens of heaven. And we're called here to set our minds on things that are above. Now I want to challenge you all with a question, and this is a question for myself too. Do you think more about the kingdom of God than you do your bank account? Do you think more about the kingdom of God than your social media account? Do you think more about the kingdom of God than your career or your political affiliation or even your family? We need to set our minds on what matters most, living for the glory of God, sharing the gospel of God, and loving the people of God. Pastor Richard Chin, in his book, Captivated by Christ, I encourage you all to read it. He puts it this way, Your life is hidden with Christ so much so that Paul can even say, Christ is your life. So that first part of our charge, delight in Christ and hate your sin, is delight in Christ. How do we do this? One thing that's helped me is when I think about what I deserve and what Christ has given me. Think about the gospel often. We were once dead sinners. We've been raised with Christ. And now we can live for the glory of God. That was actually the, mess- the point of my last message that I preached in July. And I encouraged you, one of the practical applications was to get on your knees and thank God for this indescribable gift every day. And I would continue to encourage you to do that. When we orient ourselves on the truth of the gospel, delighting in Christ becomes more natural. We realize we have nothing except Christ. Paul continues then in verse 5. He says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. And then he gives a second group, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Put to death, therefore, and put them all away. These are terms that really can be summed up in a big theological word called mortification. Mortification just means to put something to death. It means to intentionally kill something. We have a word for that in the English language, don't we? It also starts with M. It's called murder. You have to murder your sin. Every single day, you have to murder your sin. This is what Paul's telling us. I can't think of anything truthfully more hateful to do to something or someone than to take its life away intentionally. If we're going to hate our sin, and remember, sin is the one thing we're permitted to hate. We cannot do this to other people. Sin is the thing we are told to hate. If we're going to hate our sin, we have to be willing to slit its throat. We got to kill it. Paul gives us two categories of this here that we need to be on the lookout for. The first is sexual sin. 
And this was a problem in the Greco-Roman world, a big, big problem. Prostitution, licentiousness, marital unfaithfulness, homosexuality. These were rampant in the ancient world. These were part of the culture. If you read any book on the emperors of Rome in the first century, you'll get a good picture of this. Lots of unfaithfulness, which often led to murder. This happened at the top, and it trickled down. But if you think about it, it's not a whole lot different than today. Marital unfaithfulness, licentiousness, homosexuality. I would add sexual abuse and the pornography industry, which after doing some research, I realized some studies show it makes more per year, the pornography industry does, than the entire National Football League. This is rampant today. If you are a man of God or a woman of God, you must put this away. You have to kill this. This can be found nowhere among us. Sexual sin is the first category. The second is equally as deadly, although perhaps a little bit more acceptable. This is the category of words or thoughts of hatred towards another. Now remember, we cannot hate other people, but we must hate our sin. My guess is that this is a sin that we certainly all commonly deal with. Paul uses words like anger, wrath, malice, but also slander, in other words, gossip, talking badly about someone else behind their back when they can't defend themselves. Do you do this? Do you put other people down behind their back, maybe on social media? Do you use foul language? Do you speak harshly to your husband or your wife or your kids or those who work under you? This also must be found nowhere among us. Equally as deadly, different, but equally as deadly as sexual sin. John Owen, the great Puritan theologian of the 17th century, says this about killing our sin. He says, kill your sin or it will kill you. Kill your sin or it will kill you. I have an example from my house, actually, that I thought would be interesting to share with you. If any of you are like me and you live in this area and you live in a single family home and it's a little bit older and it's in a wooded area, uh, you're probably familiar with mice. (laughs) In the first year after Megan and I bought our home back in 2018, I killed somewhere between 15 and 25 mice in that first year. Now, the house that we had bought was a little bit older. It had been a rental. It was not really lived in much in the six months leading up to when we bought it. So naturally, it was a perfect place for mice to get in. Like, like I said, it was a little bit older, so there were more cracks and nooks and crannies for them to get in through. And I find it so fascinating. The people who say, and if you're one of these people, I, I'm not um, condemning you, but I am laughing at your expense. If you're one of those people who says, I don't want to kill mice when they get into my house because that's inhumane. Just trap them and release them. You don't need to kill them. Here's what I've found. If you don't kill the mice, but just trap them and release them, what's going to happen? They're going to come back. And they're going to bring their friends back. They're going to say, hey, this guy's real humane. He doesn't kill us. Oh, and also I found five other ways to get into his house that he doesn't know about. I found the only surefire way to get rid of mice in your house is to kill them. That will guarantee that they never come back. In a similar way, we have to have the same attitude with our sin. You can't just push it out and hold it at arm's length because it will come back. You have to kill it every day. And we'll see Paul talking about that that everyday idea because it's not just a uh, one and done thing. He continues in verse 9. Do not lie to one another seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. 
We are told here to put off our old selves and put on the new self. The image that comes to mind here is when you take off wet, dirty, smelly, muddy clothes after a long day doing yard work in the rain. And you take them off and you get into the shower and you put on fresh new clothes and you feel 20 pounds lighter. This is the imagery that I, that I find Paul is, is, is giving us here, the freedom that we have when we clothe ourselves with the new self given to us by Christ. There's freedom there. Now I want to point something out in verse 10. Paul says, And have put on the new self, which is being renewed. Notice, it's a process there. This is not a one and done thing. You can't say, okay, I'm going home today and I'm going to kill the sin in my life and, it's, and we're going to be done with it. The rest of my life, I'll be free. That's not how it works. We have to continually, I believe it's a daily battle where we wake up and we say, Lord, give me the strength to kill this again today and again and again and again. And it is a process. I want to encourage you all. We're talking about killing our sin and it's violent and but I want, you, I want you to remember that Christ gives us the strength to do this. And Christ also has provided salvation for us even when we mess up. You will not be perfect at this. That is good, good news. Boy, if, if it were up to us to kill our sin perfectly, none of us would do it. We can't, even after trusting in Christ. That's why the gospel is so beautiful. Christ did it for us. Be encouraged. And then in verse 11, we see this beautiful conclusion here that your identity is no longer wrapped up in your race or your situation. Paul talks about being Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, which was the, really the, the, the outward representation of Greek or Jew. Barbarian, Scythian, slave, and free. We can assume in this congregation, Paul was speaking to people who fell into each of these categories. But he says, Christ is all and in all. I went through a very neat identity change when I married Megan four and a half years ago. Before I married Megan, uh, I was, some would call me, you know, Seth the comedian, or at least I like to believe so. Uh, Seth the athlete, which I really liked to believe so and was probably not true. Uh, Seth the musician, Seth the history nerd, uh, Seth the whatever, the Eagles fan, the guy who hated the Cowboys. After we got married though, it was no longer me. Now it was Seth and Megan, Megan and Seth. My identity forever changed because of my union with this other person. When we're in Christ, our identity changes. Now Christ is everything. Christ is all and in all. So let me remind you once again, as we get ready to close here, delight in Christ and hate your sin. Delight in Christ and hate your sin. This is Paul's encouragement for the Colossian believers, and this is encouragement for us too. And so as we close, I want you to consider a question that I know when I ask myself this question, it's painful. It's often hard. The process is tough. Kind of like what Mrs. Kindle just explained to us with, you know, when God carves the pumpkin, I would imagine if the pumpkin had feelings, it would probably hurt getting a knife driven into you. This is a painful process sometimes. But here's the question I want you to ask. What is the secret sin that I have kept merely at arm's length? And what do I need to do to kill it? What is the sin or sins that I have just kept at arm's length that I'm loving a little too much or perhaps not hating enough? And what do I need to do to kill it? Let me share three examples. Perhaps it is some form of sexual sin. Perhaps it's pornography or lust or a secret relationship or an inappropriate relationship. Ask yourself, what do I need to do to kill this? That's the only way I'm going to be free from it is if I kill it. Maybe if it's pornography, maybe it's getting rid of internet on your phone. Maybe it's getting rid of your computer altogether. 
If it's an inappropriate relationship, maybe it's ending that relationship forever. Because this relationship is harming your spouse or your family or your relationship with Christ. Maybe it's not a sexual sin. Maybe it's gossip or slander, that second category that Paul gave us. These sins can be so easily covered up and and in disguise, by the way, under a guise of just wanting to know the facts, or worse yet, even more sinister, under the guise of prayer. I have a prayer request to share about my neighbor down the road who I don't like, whose son or daughter just got arrested. And it makes me feel a little bit better to share this. Gossip, if you think about it, is just a twisted effort to confront sin without actually confronting the person who needs to be confronted, right? How do we kill this sin? Maybe it's as simple as keeping your mouth shut. Maybe it's as simple as keeping your mouth shut. If the temptation comes to speak badly about someone else, if you don't say anything at all, you have not gossiped. Perhaps you need to then work on your heart You know, if you're still feeling bitterness toward that person, maybe it's time to say something to them in a loving way as Jesus lays out for us in Matthew 18. But sometimes it's as simple as just not opening your mouth. Amen. Maybe it's not that sin. Maybe it's one that Paul doesn't mention here, but he does mention elsewhere. Maybe it's laziness. This is a struggle for me. Maybe you arrive home from work at five o'clock at the end of the day And your go-to, instead of being ready to be there to serve your spouse and your children, your go-to is to turn on the TV or open up your phone and check out. Maybe your default is um, not, how can I serve the people around me and in so doing glorify God with this free time that he's given me, but rather it's free time is about me. Free time is me time. How can you kill this? I've had to work on this one a lot in my life. And one thing that I have tried to do that I've not done perfectly, but by God's grace, he has revealed to me through his word is that when I arrive home at the end of the day, saying a quick prayer, asking the Lord, Lord, give me the strength, the patience, and the endurance to make these hours from five o'clock until I go to bed the best hours of my day. Give me the strength to serve my wife and my daughter and in so doing, die to myself and glorify you, Lord. I'd encourage you to consider that if that is perhaps the sin that you're struggling with. Maybe it's something else. But ultimately, when you go at this sin, remember the victory has already been won. We look to Christ, amen. Christ is all and in all. Christ has already defeated the giant of sin on our behalf. We simply live in obedience to him. That's really what killing our sin and delighting in Christ is. It's just obeying Christ. I've found that when we delight in Christ, what happens? The healthy hatred for our sin grows. And the more we hate our sin the easier it becomes to delight in Christ. These two things are related to each other. So be encouraged. Christ has done the work for you. We must simply be obedient by delighting in him, by realizing the life that he offers is better than anything else, and by hating and killing our sin. So I hope that this message has been an encouragement to you. If I can leave you with one sentence, it would be our sentence we've talked about. Delight in Christ and kill your sin. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the time that we've had together to dive into your word. Lord, we pray that you would give us the strength, the ability to deny ourselves, to put off the old self, to kill our old selves, and to delight in you. We pray, Lord, that if there are any unconfessed or secret sins in our hearts, that you would bring them to our minds now, 
that we would confess them, that we would experience the freedom that you promise us, that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just, and you will forgive us every time. We thank you, Lord, for this beautiful truth, and we pray that it would guide us this week in everything we say and do. In Jesus' name, amen.